Have you ever experienced drift in your blacksmith shop? Now, I'm not talking about the tool, a drift, or the task of drifting maybe the eye of an axe. I'm talking about something completely different. This is something a friend of mine used to talk about. Unfortunately, he has passed away. But Bill used to work on houses and cars and do just all sorts of stuff, spent most of his day in his shop or doing something. And he used to talk about the concept of drift, those days where you spend the entire day in the shop and don't really do any one thing. Maybe that's what people used to call puttering, but you go from one job to the other and you get distracted by this thing over here and this thing over there and you take a look at an ax you haven't finished and maybe you got a vise that needs to have a stand built for it and that floor needs to be swept and you got a few other things and before long you've spent the entire day in the shop with not, without ever finishing one project. Lately, that's kind of the way my time has gone here in the blacksmith shop. Lots of drifting, although things are getting done just in little increments here and there and not any one big project. So today I thought I would take a moment and talk about some of these things I've been up to, some of my distractions, what I'm working on, where I'm trying to go with things, and some of the things that I need to do here in the shop that aren't necessarily forging, but are going to help with the forging in the long run. Hope that makes sense by the end of the video. And a good place to start today's discussion is with some of the stuff that has come in the mail over the past, oh, couple of months, really. I, I don't really do these mail call videos very often. And while a lot of this is just stuff that I have ordered because it's something I wanted or needed in the shop, people do send some stuff from time to time, thank you gifts, little th tokens of appreciation, and I thought I would share some of this stuff with you. This is a little bottle opener that Thomas sent. I'm actually starting to acquire quite a few bottle openers made by other blacksmiths. One of these days I'm going to have to make a little display rack or something so I can have all these so I can have all these out where I can actually see them and appreciate them. Right now they all uh, go in a little pencil holder on my desk. Anyway, this is the Thomas that works with Roy over at Christ Centered Ironworks and he sent a little note with this. It says, "Thank you John for all the knowledge that you're willing to share." I look forward to any video, short Facebook posts that you put out, and the inspiration that you've given me. If you want to, you can show this in one of your videos. Thank you again. P.S. This was my first making of Mokam, Mokam, Mokami. I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, but anyways, it's sort of like Damascus, but made with non-ferrous materials, brass, copper, that kind of stuff. And it, this is his first effort, and it's been riveted to the bottle opener. So it's an interesting touch. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. Now, Zach over at ZH Fabrication sent me a little tin of his new forge finish wax a while back. Let me try that out. That's now in production, so I ordered a larger tin of it to make sure I had some to try out and give it a really good test. And this is Blacksmith Forge Finish High Gloss Zach's Wax ZH Fabrication. I'll leave a link down below for this and any of the other things that are actually products that you can buy. But this looks to be a really good substitute for the Johnson's Paste Wax. It's got all food safe elements in it, although it hadn't been FDA approved. I've used this on a few things already, and I think it's gonna be a really good product, really nice to have. And I like the screw top he puts on these tins. I always ended up losing the lids on the Johnson's Paste Wax because you had to put them back in with a hammer and I never bothered to do that. So Zach, thanks for putting out a great product. This is something I received a few months ago, and I wasn't sure if I could share it. It kind of seems a little personal, but I also think it's something that you would appreciate, and it's really something pretty heartwarming that Stephen sent me. So I hope Stephen is okay with me sharing his letter with you. On May 25th, I will be retiring from the United States Navy after 39 years of naval service to include service in the Cold War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The... The common question I get asked is, what are you going to do now? Well, my answer is, learn to be a blacksmith. You see, a few years ago, I knew that the day would come when I have to retire from the Navy, and I figured out if I wanted to live long and happy life, I would need to stay busy. I have always enjoyed working with my hands, but I find I am too impatient for woodworking, and because I rush it, I tend to be a bit of a hack. Boy, I know how you feel. That's kind of the way I do a lot of things, too. 
But steel is different and the metal moves so fast and I find it forces me to slow down and be patient. So a few years ago, after watching your videos, I began building a modest forge, attending classes at the Virginia Institute of Blacksmithing. Never heard of the Virginia Institute of Blacksmithing, so that's a resource that might be worth checking out. Though my instructor is very good, I still find the most helpful thing that educates and inspires me are your YouTube videos. Thank you so much for providing such great content and being so encouraging. To show my appreciation, I am enclosing a challenge coin. I think firefighters use them as well as the military. I had this coin made for my retirement and would be honored if you would accept it as a token of my appreciation. Now time for me to put my safety glasses on and get out to the forge and make something. Most likely a bottle opener. I'm still pretty new at this. So Stephen, congratulations on your retirement. Thanks for your years of service. And I really appreciate the coin. This is really a touching thing for you to send me. It's really special. And I'll make sure this goes in a safe place where I don't lose track of it. You know, in the long run, it's knowing that I am able to affect people's lives, teach them some new skills that they can use to live a better life for themselves, enjoy a new hobby or a new business opportunity, and all of those things make doing these videos worthwhile. And it's these little tokens of appreciation that really drive that point home. Whether we're making big projects, window grills or gates, or just making bottle openers, punches, chisels, things like that. So I suspect we're going to be seeing videos here on Black Bear Forge for many years to come. Now I've got a couple of books here that I ordered. Neither one of these was sent as a gift. And these are on anvils. And in the past, I have repaired one anvil, done some hard facing on it, fixed up the chip corners. And I swore to myself, I would never do that again. I'm having a little bit of change of heart for various reasons. And one of those things is that you frequently ask, how can I repair this anvil? How can I make this usable? Is this a worthwhile anvil to buy? And I am no expert on old anvils. The people that wrote these books are the experts on old anvils. This is Anvils in America by Richard Postman. And this is the authoritative work on what anvils have been available, at least in North America. A lot of them are international brands, but there's a lot more available over in Europe than there ever was here. There is so much information in here. If you're interested in old anvils, if you've got an old anvil, you don't know what it is. I have no idea. I'm no expert. This is the expert, and this is worth buying. At one point, these were really hard to come by, and I think they were selling for two or $300 a copy for a while. They're now available for around $100 from several suppliers. I got this copy from Centaur Forge. Came within a couple of days. It's in its eighth printing or something like that. The copyright on this is 1998, and it's now in its eighth printing. So this is a really popular book. If you're into old anvils, you really ought to have this book. Heck, if you're just into blacksmithing, you'd probably appreciate having it, even if you're never going to buy an old anvil yourself. Now, this other book I didn't even know existed until I bought a really beat-up Fisher anvil. It's missing the tail. Don't know if I'm going to be able to fix that one or not. But I started doing some research, and I ran across the Fisher Norris Museum, which is a private museum by appointment only. And the founder of that museum, Joshua Cavett, wrote this book on fisher anvils. So while Anvils in America talks about fisher anvils to some extent, this is an even more authoritative work just on the fisher anvils and the anvils that he has in his collection there at the museum. I think it's in New Jersey. That would be a long trip. I'd have to plan at least a full week just to go see the museum for an afternoon. But if you're interested in old anvils, particularly fisher anvils, this would be a great book. And I think both books are well worth having in your library. Now, as far as doing some anvil repairs, that's something I'll probably end up doing either later in the summer or early fall after I get a few other things taken care of. These aren't anvils I actually need to do any work. They're just anvils I felt sorry for. And I'll talk a little bit more about my philosophy of when you should or shouldn't buy an old anvil or fix up an old anvil when we do those videos. But my philosophy is changing a little bit, so hopefully I'll be able to explain that at that point. And that leaves us with this box from Copper State Forge. We've looked at forging skillets here at Black Bear Forge in the past, but mine are a little bit on the rustic side, shall we say. 
some people might say crude. But the folks over at Copper State Forge do a much better job, and they also watch my videos and, and appreciate what it is we do here at Black Bear Forge. So they sent me a sample of one of their skillets that they forge over there. And I think they do a lot of this under big hydraulic press, although some of their videos show a big fly press as well. In either case, these are nice smooth skillets. Stuff isn't going to stick to these like they might in one of the ones I did. This is a hybrid skillet. Part of it's round, part of it is faceted, so you can get a spatula down in there. I'm going to enjoy using this. In fact, I think I might fix dinner in this tonight. Don't know what dinner is, but it's going to be fried. So I want to thank Thomas and Bill over at Copper State for the work they're doing. They have some excellent videos on YouTube on how they make these skillets. And I'll put a link to their channel right over here. Now, a lot of you have asked about this Wilton Vice. This is going to get its own video, and I've got some things to do to get it permanently installed. Right now, it's just vice grip to the bench. And that's part of the drift issue that I think about, well, does it go here? Does it go over there? Where am I going to get the best use out of it? And I have a plan, but I think it's worthy of its own video. Another thing that has been taking up a lot of my time is over in the new little shop that's going to be the hand tool shop. And there's some things I need to do in that shop that are going to help Janet out in the long run as well. What is Janet's weaving got to do with the priorities of the little shop? And how does that determine what the next phase is going to be. Well, I hope to talk about that a little bit today. I'm standing in the opposite corner of the little shop from where the coal forge is going to go. And I always intended to put a wood stove over here, so it needs to have a wall finish that is non-combustible. Still need to provide appropriate clearances for a wood stove even then. But the cement board does help make things safer. Now I had a little stove very similar to the one in the main shop that I thought I would put in here. But Janet sometimes needs to dye wool when she's doing her weaving and that takes a big pot of hot water, and it's not the best thing to do with the kitchen. It's kind of messy, and sometimes it involves some chemicals that you don't really want around your food. So a low wood stove with a flat top is the ideal thing to put in this location. So we went over to Canyon City. There's a wood stove shop over there that has a pretty big collection of vintage wood stoves. We found a cute little cast iron stove that I think is gonna be just ideal. It'll give her a surface she can heat water on, and it will provide a little bit of supplemental heat in here if I'm working in here in cold weather over the winter. And hopefully we'll be able to do some of that. Now, of course, when we got the thing home and I was getting ready to unload it, I checked the legs, and two of them were a little bit loose. But the bolts on the legs, like most fasteners on a wood stove, didn't want to turn, and I managed to shear the first bolt head off. So I brought it in here, turned it upside down, put penetrating oil all over the other one that was loose in hopes that I would be able to either get the bolt out and put a fresh one in or be able to tighten it that half or one turn that it needed. Unfortunately, that one sheared off as well. So I ended up having to drill those out, run a tap through to clean out the threads, put new stainless steel bolts in those two legs, so now it's good and solid. Just need to get the chimney installed. And we do have all the chimney for that little stove it's over here, I just need to get it installed. But I'll probably wait until I have all the chimney parts for the coal forge so that I can do all of that work together. It's gonna to be essentially the same installation, just on opposite corners of the little shop. Now there's been a lot of enthusiasm for this little shop. There have been some direct donations to help fund the project, a little bit of increase in channel memberships and in Patreon patrons, and all of that makes me pretty confident that this is a good idea, a good way to go. So I've ordered the chimney for this. It's not available locally. It has to be shipped truck freight. It should be here in a couple of weeks. And hopefully this summer I will find a day that's not too miserably hot to work on the roof. And I'll get both of these chimneys put in. 
Then it'll just be a matter of getting a mount made for that Champion 400 blower, getting it on the forge, and maybe before the end of summer, we'll be able to have our first fire in the coal forge. In the meantime, I've been able to work over here using this little gas forge that Viver sent, and it's actually been kind of nice to work in here, smaller shop, a little bit less complicated, and I think I see great potential in here in the future. But most of what we do in here long term will be in the coal forge. And this little shop is one of the places that I tend to drift around trying to decide exactly where some of these things are going to go. The coal forge and the little wood stove are pretty much a done deal. Those aren't going to move around much. But things like an anvil and a vise, there's still some wiggle room in there trying to decide exactly where I want to put those. And this little vise is kind of handy because it's lightweight. And I can move it around and decide, do I want it over here? Do I want it over there? And how far away from the coal forge do I want it? The other thing is a post vise. And I'm thinking about putting it over here because it would have more room to work around the vise. But I'm also used to having it kind of on the back wall behind the anvil. So we're going to see in the most out of the way place, of course, would be over on the little bench where I've got that little red vise right now. Hard to say exactly, so I'm going to move things around. And as much as I don't like a blacksmith's vise on a portable stand, I think I'm going to look at a portable stand for a larger vise than what this little one is, just to be able to move it around. And if I decide that the portable stand doesn't work, I should have a better idea of where I want to install it permanently. So we'll just see what happens with all that stuff. Now, what are my other plans for this shop? Now there will definitely be a workbench over here and I mocked up an L-shaped bench just to see if I liked it. And so far I think this is a pretty workable arrangement. I'd like something a little wider than what my mock-up is and certainly something more solid. This wiggles and shakes when you're working in the vise. And of course it's going to need a better vise on the bench in addition to the post vise. So maybe a bench vise over here or maybe a second post vise. We'll just see how all that goes and when I can get around to building that bench. I think I might have most of the materials for it, so it shouldn't be too big a deal to get built. And of course we'll need some tool racks and other ways to hang tools over here on this wall where it's close to the forge and even close to this bench. This is going to be a really compact arrangement, but I think it can be highly functional. That leaves one more corner on the opposite side over there where all that chimney pipe is stored right now. And I'm thinking maybe I will make a second, more simple treadle hammer, something a little bit easier to construct than the inline hammer I have in the main shop. But put that over there, and this really then becomes a very functional non-electric shop. Do you remember working on this little grill? It was several years ago that we made this to go on this window. I've got it up temporarily. The window still has to come back out. It needs to be re-puttied and painted and then I'll install the window permanently, then I'll install the grill permanently. And this thing has sat out in the weather for years. It was kind of rusty. I gave it a wire brushing and put some OSFO, that's a phosphoric acid treatment that is supposed to neutralize rust. I wasn't real impressed with exactly how it came out. It should turn everything that had rust on it a deep black color and it was really kind of an oddball looking thing. So I didn't like it a lot. Went ahead and put pine tar over it to see what that looks like. And I see something is turning white. And I don't know if that's the OSFO under the pine tar or if that's the pine tar doing something. Pine tar shouldn't do that. There's nothing in there that should turn that color. So I think that's some sort of late reaction with the OSFO. And I'm not real wild about the way it looks. So this is going to have to come off and I'll probably have to power wire brush it and redo the finish on it. I still like the idea of pine tar on some of this stuff because it is so easy to apply and I really like the look of it. But since I didn't like the way the OSFO worked, I checked out another product that I saw, I think it was Will Stetler using in a video where he restored a vise. And that's this stuff. This is CRC Rust Converter. It's rather expensive. It was something like $150 for a gallon of it. But this looks like it turns the iron regardless of whether it's lightly rusted or whether it's been cleaned off a little bit with a wire brush, a nice even black color. So I think I'm going to like this better. I haven't finished working on this grill yet. This is one I made ages ago. 
I probably finished this grill more than 10 years ago. It's been sitting around waiting to go on the main door of the shop. But that's another project I need to work on. That door sags a little bit. I need to do a little bit of glue up and carpentry on it, make sure it's tight, make some braces to reinforce it, and then I'll be able to mount this grill to the front of that door. But this grill was made to go on that door, and it really needs to be up there instead of just sitting around. There's still a lot of this to do, and after seeing what that other little grill looks like, I'm gonna to wait to put the pine tar on this until I'm sure that this doesn't change color over time and sitting out in the weather. And that's another little drift issue. I took some of the old cinder blocks that were the shelves in the little shop and some of the shelving material that I had in there, and I built this little table out here just for doing some of this finish work so I don't have to take up space in the main shop and leave something on my bench for a week or two weeks while I get around to all the different steps in finishing. As long as it doesn't rain too much, it's a pretty nice place to work. Now, I think a lot of what I'm going to do in the shop this summer is going to be a lot of these little projects, trying to get these things like this taken care of that have been hanging over my head for years, try and get the little shop finished up, deal with that Wilton vice. There's some other maintenance and repair issues I need to take care of. So there may not be a lot of really big projects going on in the shop like I'd really hope to do this summer. But we'll do some little stuff. And for that matter, I've actually done a lot of videos ahead. So if in the next few months you see me wearing flannel shirts or a wool stocking cap or something like that in the videos, that's because I filmed those videos a couple of months ago and I just have them scheduled out through the summer. And they'll be short little videos just to make sure there's a continuous stream of content throughout the summer. And that takes us to the project that is the highest priority for the summer that I still haven't gotten around to, and here it is, early June already. And of course, that's getting to work on this little cabin project. This is an old homestead cabin from the mid to late 1800s that was on a ranch not far from here. It had been disassembled and the log saved. Person that did that, oh, that was probably 20 years ago at this point, never got around to putting it up. We bought the logs from them maybe 15 years ago, sat up here under a tarp for years and years. We finally got them put back up, and they've been sitting at this point now for about five years. We just never seem to have the time to put it up because we are so busy doing other things. Janet's weaving, I'm working in the blacksmith shop, I'm making videos for YouTube, and that all takes an incredible amount of time but we got to get this thing sealed up. We at least have to get it weather tight. It may not get finished this year, but we want to get all the chinking done, which is what fills in the gaps between the logs here, and get the doors and the windows in so that it's weather tight. Animals aren't going to take up residence in there. Blowing snow and rain not going to get in there. And then we can work on the inside a little bit more leisurely. But this is my priority for this summer. If I only have time to make videos about one topic, this will be it. The videos that I've done ahead will be the ones you see here on Black Bear Forge. And if I have time, I will make more videos for Black Bear Forge. My question to you is, do you want to see this project here on Black Bear Forge, or should I keep all the cabin-related videos and the non-blacksmithing stuff over on my personal channel, the John Switzer channel? That's where the things that I've done up here already are and the other topics, the things that have nothing to do with blacksmithing, usually end up over there. But they are tool construction related and the kind of things that probably interest the same type of person that is interested in blacksmithing. So if you'd like to see those videos are here, or some of those videos here, or some version of those videos here, whatever the case may be, let me know down in the comments section it's all the same to me. If we're up here working, there's gonna be cameras and I'm gonna record a lot of it and it doesn't take that much more time to turn that into a video at that point. They'll probably be simple videos or not how-to videos, not instructional videos. Just kind of follow along videos, updates on how the process is going and what we're getting done, a little bit about the materials and the techniques, things like that, but not a detailed how-to like we usually do in the blacksmith shop. Just let me know.